Hi everybody. So instead of covering this material in class, I'm just going to record this brief video to give you all exposure to the ideas here. So we're going to talk about ethical business governance. This is, it will have some important principles for you to understand when it comes to being an ethical leader of organizations. And because we're talking about business governance, we're going to be talking about sort of some high level structural ways that businesses should operate. We're going to begin with this. Um, so this is a illustration of how sort of ideally the power structure should work within a corporation. At the bottom right you see we've got officers. These are like the CEO. Uh, certain vice presidents might be officers, COO, th those sorts of roles, president. These are all officers of a company whose job is to sort of run the organization from day to day. The officers should report to the board of directors um, and the board of directors Overseas, They hire the officers, they oversee their work, hold them accountable, and then the board of directors, in turn, is elected by and responsible to the shareholders. And you can see also in this uh, graphic, you can see value is supposed to be created by the officers, uh, managed by the board of directors, and then passed along to the shareholders. And sadly, what's kind of happened is that those roles have been inverted, where officers are taking um, precedence over uh, everything. Where the officers man control the board of directors through something called board capture and then the shareholders sort of come last. And I apologize that the graphic display where there. I'm not sure why. So the problem lies largely when you get this inverted uh, governance structure uh, where the officers are sort of at the top of the chain rather than at the bottom. A lot of these failures have to do with the board of directors. And the board of directors is the group that oversees the company in a governance sense. They're the ones who, uh, who, who manage the financial objectives and overall strategy. They're in charge of c compensation and succession, both for themselves and for all the officers of the company. And they have this role of advising and counseling top management. And I wanna make one principle really clear. The board of directors is the group that is ultimately responsible for the success of the organization. We usually assign that responsibility to like the CEO or the president of the company, but it's the board of directors that chooses that person to be CEO. And so a really common mistake that people make is they think it all falls on the shoulders of the CEO. The problem with that approach is then you're sort of letting the board of directors off without any accountability. The people they hire to run the organization as a board of directors should be people that they choose in good faith and making good, uh, who, people who will make good decisions but sometimes a board is sort of chosen and, and influenced so heavily by the CEO that it's more like the board is doing what the CEO wants rather than the other way around. And we see the effects of this increasing amount of board capture where the officers are the ones telling the board what to do. We see the effects of that playing out in a variety of ways. And one of them, for example, is in the level of CEO compensation. So the, one of the ways you can measure the amount of money that CEOs get paid is by comparing the CEO's compensation to that of the average worker within the company. And you can see that this ratio has gone, has skewed really heavily in favor of CEOs over time. So way back in 1965, a CEO typically got paid about 21 times whatever the average worker was paid. And then in 1978, you saw that rise to 61 uh, times higher then uh, 2018, 2019, you see that it's actually over 300 times as much as the average worker is paid. So CEO compensation has gone up really dramatically. We're paying CEOs more on a relative basis than they've ever been paid before. And you can imagine how that would be one of the byproducts of board capture. Because if the board of directors is just doing what the CEO wants, then that's going to include approving a very generous compensation package for CEOs. On a relative basis, you can also see that CEO compensation has grown faster, for example, than the stock market during that same time period, and also faster than the earnings of the 0.1%. So CEOs fit within that category of the 0.1%, generally speaking, but CEOs, their compensation has grown faster during that time period. And so some of the questions we won't discuss because we're doing this material on Zoom instead, but ones to think about is, you know, why are the CEOs the ones who are disproportionately benefiting from the growth of companies? And are there ethical problems that are associated with this trend?
I think there are. If you remember early in the semester when we talked about Milton Friedman, we talked about the fact that shareholders have had diminished power over companies through, through the last hundred years. And that diminished power allows companies to behave in a way that doesn't always benefit shareholders or, for that matter, stakeholders more generally. If you have a board that's focused primarily on making a CEO happy, you can imagine how that could lead to all kinds of bad decisions. There's another factor, though, that it sort of accelerates board capture, that allows boards to behave a little more recklessly or a little more too much, a little too biased in favor of CEOs. And it's a legal principle that we talked about earlier in the semester when we talked about the business judgment rule. So the business judgment rule is a legal doctrine that's in place that was cultivated first in, in Delaware, where most businesses in the U.S. are incorporated, and then expanded to other states. And the basic way to think about the business judgment rule is that courts are not allowed to second guess the decisions made by boards of directors or by officers. Courts aren't allowed to second guess those decisions unless the decisions are so bad that the only explanation we have is that they were intentionally bad decisions. A decision that's intentionally bad is called a bad faith decision. And here, the way this legal doctrine works with the business judgment rule is it says that if shareholders want to sue the board by saying that the board made bad decisions, a court is only allowed to, to second guess the decisions of a board if the decisions are so bad that the only explanation we have is that they were bad faith decisions, or in other words, intentionally bad decisions. And I'll kind of illustrate that in a case here in a minute. But you can see what this does is this messes up, this allows boards of directors to sort of shed further responsibility to shareholders. It creates a very low bar for the board to get over when it comes to pr legal protection for their decisions. Um, my next slide is messed up. I'm not sure what happened there. Sorry, everybody. Anyway, so let me kind of illustrate how this works in practice. Uh, boards of directors are supposed to exhibit two different they're supposed to uh, uphold two different uh, fiduciary duties or responsibilities they have. One is the duty of loyalty, and the other is the duty of care. And basically, these two responsibilities are the standards to which we hold a board of directors. So, for example, they'll say we can't have a board engage in what's called self-dealing, which means they can't they can't make decisions to 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 enrich themselves at the expense of the company. It means they have to be honest and disclose things. So if they have a conflict of interest, for example, they have to share it with the rest of the board of directors. They have to share it with the company, with the shareholders too. It also means that in general, they have to put the organization's interests ahead of their own personal interests. So in, if there's ever a conflict between the board member's benefit and the company's benefit, they have to put the company's benefit first. It also assumes that the that the board act reasonably, that they act with reasonable care. Now, if you hear that as a standard, reason, what is, you might wonder, what is reasonable care? Well, one thing is that it means that at a minimum, a director has to be informed. So there's a story, for example, about a, um, there's a story about a, an actual case about a, a, a lady who was on the board of directors of a company that was previously owned by her husband who passed away. She took over his ownership and also his board seat but she never went to board meetings. She was old and, and was an alcoholic. So she never went to these board meetings. And in the meantime, her two sons, who are the other two board members, embezzled a bunch of money from the company. The other shareholders got mad. They sued. They obviously sued the two sons, but they also sued the mom, even though she wasn't involved in the embezzlement. But they said she violated the duty of care. And her defense in court was, well, I didn't, I didn't do anything wrong. I wasn't even at board meetings. How was I supposed to know this was happening? <laughs> That's a bad defense if you're a board member is to say, I was never around. So at a minimum, you need to be participating. You need to be informed. But then the next question is, well, how careful do you have to be? What's a reasonable decision for a board to make? Well, we're going to measure that by the business judgment rule. And I'm going to give you an example of a case that kind of illustrates this idea. In the mid-90s, uh, Disney Corporation was run by a guy named Michael Eisner. Uh, Michael Eisner was a really successful CEO. 
He had built up the company to be a major media empire. He's the one who oversaw the purchase of ABC and ESPN. So that's why Disney owns those two networks. Um, and he was the one who sort of built it into this massive media company. In the mid-90s, the president of Disney, so th these are two different roles. Eisner was CEO and this other guy was president. The president of Disney, who got along really well with Eisner and had a great working relationship, he died in a really tragic helicopter accident in, um, during a skiing trip in Colorado. And so because he died, the board of directors of Disney had to find somebody new. And Michael Eisner said, hey, I've got a friend. His name is Michael Ovitz. So Eisner in this picture is the guy on the left. Ovitz is the, is the guy on the right. Michael Ovitz was the largest, uh, sorry, was the managing partner of the largest talent agency in the world. He was incredibly successful um, and uh, seemed to be a good manager. And so Michael Eisner said, hey, let's hire my friend Ovitz. So the board of directors interviewed Ovitz. They hired a compensation consultant to figure out how much they should pay him. So they set up a whole compensation package and they offered him the job. And so uh, the, the reason this went to court is because immediately after getting the job, Michael Ovitz started doing terrible work. He only showed up half the time. And the time that he was there, he was, he was offending everybody, like really hard to get along with. And the relationship was so bad and his work performance was so bad that 14 months later, excuse me, 14 months later, the board of directors decided they had to, they had to get rid of Michael Ovitz. This was a disaster. This was like a catastrophically bad decision. And so they had to decide, do we fire Michael Ovitz or do we let him go, let him walk away um, uh, by, and firing him meant that they had to fire him for what was called cause, meaning they had to have a really good reason, a legally compelling reason to fire him. Usually it meant like gross negligence, he committed a crime or, or, or did something else that violated his contract. Well, they had to decide, it was his bad performance, gross negligence, was it so bad that we can fire him for cause or do we just ask him to resign? Well, if they ask him to resign, it creates a problem because it triggers what's called, and you may have heard this term before, a golden parachute. Basically a big severance package that he would get paid if they asked him to resign. If they fired him, they wouldn't owe him anything. So the board had to decide what to do and they decided, well, let's just ask him to resign. So they asked Michael Ovitz to resign and in the process triggered his golden parachute. For 14 months of work, Michael Ovitz got paid $140 million. I mean, that's a pretty good job if you can get it, right? $140 million just to show up half the time and do a bad job when you're there. So the shareholders are furious, and they sued both, both Michael Eisner, but also the entire board of directors. And they sued them for violating the duty of care. They said, you guys did such a sloppy job here. You cost us a bunch of money as shareholders, and we're upset. And so Brem, in this lawsuit, is, was one of the main shareholders in the lawsuit. Well, the, the court had to decide whether or not uh, the board had violated the duty of care. And what they did is they went back to that business judgment rule. They had to say, okay, was this such a bad job, such a bad decision, that the only explanation we have is that it was a, an intentionally bad decision? So if the board can come up with any good faith reasons for it, any good intentions behind their decision, even if the outcome was catastrophically bad, then the board would get off without any penalty. Well, if you think about it, all along the way, they had good faith reasons for hiring Mike Lovitz. He was highly respected and well qualified. When they set his compensation package, they hired a compensation consultant, an outsider, who told them how much they thought they needed to pay Ovitz. The contract was drafted with the help of lawyers and negotiated fairly and at arm's length. And when it came time to fire him, they had to decide between firing him for cause or or uh, asking him to, to resign. Now, maybe you could argue that they should have just fired him. But if you fire Michael Ovitz, it's going to trigger a bunch of lawsuits. He's going to be upset. He's going to think he wasn't treated fairly. You may get mired in lawsuits. And if you're dealing with a bunch of lawsuits from the, for from the former president of Disney, you're going to have a hard time hiring the new one, which, again, is a good faith reason to ask him to resign instead of just firing him.
So along the way, the board had good faith reasons, even though hiring him was a huge mistake. Promising to pay him what they paid him was a huge mistake. And asking him to resign instead of firing him was a huge mistake. These weren't intentionally bad mistakes, meaning that the, the board didn't intentionally make bad faith decisions here. And because that was the case, the business judgment rule protected the board of directors and the shareholders lost this lawsuit. And Mike Leisner and the rest of the board of directors got away without paying any penalty for this whole debacle. So as you can see, it's a really low bar that a board has to get over to be protected personally for their bad decisions. So it makes you wonder, what do we do? Like, if this is the case, if boards of directors can act so so recklessly, so foolishly, <clears throat> can make such bad choices, how do we hold boards to a higher standard for their behavior? Well, a lot of that comes through shareholder activism. It comes through creating standards that we expect companies to follow when they manage their boards. So here's a list, for example, of standards that we'd expect from a well-run board. That, for example, your board doesn't have two or three more than two or three inside directors. An inside director is a director who's on the board but also works for the company in some other respect. You make sure that you don't have old board members who don't pay attention anymore. You elect your board every year. You limit the number of boards that other boards that a board member can be on. You make sure that that you have independence and the right responsibilities like audit compensation, nominating, and so forth. And you hold the CEO to high standards. So you evaluate the CEO's performance in, by independent directors. You link the CEO's pay to specific performance goals. And you also make sure that directors are all shareholders so that way their interests are aligned with that of the other shareholders as much as possible. And so you can see how we can create standards of board behavior that then get reported to shareholders. So if you're a shareholder, you can figure out, oh, is this a well-run board that follows high standards or is it not? So that's one of the things we do is we create market pressure on boards of directors to behave better. But, you know, there's a lot more we need to worry about and think about. And that's why this is still an open question when it comes to ethical business government governance. Because the law still favors boards of directors. It still says that boards are protected for their reckless decisions. As long as they weren't intentionally bad faith decisions, they sort of get off the hook. Now, there are some arguments in favor of this policy. If you're on a board, you're going to make decisions that involve risk. And not every decision you make is going to work out. Um, but still, you can see how we've sort of created a power imbalance where boards of directors have a lot more power to get away with things than uh, maybe they should. <clears throat> One of those things, like we've talked about, is that CEOs are getting paid a lot. And there are some arguments uh, for and against this high level of CEO pay. Arguments for the increasing of CEO pay that sort of justify how much CEOs are paid today are that these are just well-paid managers who are being rewarded for high performance. These high salaries also create the right kinds of incentives for innovation and risk-taking. And, you know, not everybody can run a big company. Like being a CEO of a large company is a, is a challenging skill, and not everybody's good at it. And we see that because there are a lot of bad CEOs in the world. But, you know, if we think about it, there are some arguments against high CEO pay as well. For example, inflated CEO pay actually makes firms less competitive, and it makes it harder for them to compete against foreign rivals. The CEO, the way CEOs are compensated doesn't really always tie to performance, and so some really bad CEOs are being paid for failure instead of success. And these multi-million dollar salaries actually can create resentment and low mor lower morale among workers. And so it actually can create lower performance when you pay a CEO too much money. So an interesting and open question here is, how much do you pay a CEO if they're performing well and how much is too much? We really still haven't quite figured this out. The idea is that the market sort of tells us, but there are market distortions at work, uh, like board capture and other things. Also, for example, half of the companies in the, half of the Fortune 500 companies that hire compensation consultants pay those consultants to do other work which means that the consultant is going to want to make the CEO happy with a really excessive package because their other consulting work depends on keeping the CEO happy. So there are all these sort of market distortions in place, maybe inflating CEO compensation. CEOs in the U.S. are also paid disproportionately higher than CEOs of companies in other countries. There are some legislative effects to try to limit the power and sort of freedom of CEOs and boards of directors to get away with stuff. 
Sarbanes-Oxley, which was passed in 2002 and went into effect in 2005, is an example of this. This law was passed following some of the big, great uh, like financial scandals like Enron and WorldCom and Tyco, where shareholders were essentially lied to about the finances of these companies. So Sarbanes-Oxley imposed a whole bunch of requirements on publicly traded companies. You have to have a disclosed uh, code of ethics for financial officers. You have to have an independent audit committee. You have to rotate your audit firm every five years. Uh, you're not allowed to engage in personal loans for executives and directors, and there are fines and imprisonment now for retaliating against whistleblowers and also criminal liability for document destruction. That last one is rooted in a very specific event when the SEC announced its investigation into Arthur Anderson, or sorry, into Enron, the accounting firm Arthur Anderson, who was doing all the financial accounting at audit for Arthur and sorry for Enron, the Arthur Anderson accountants shredded in one day two thousand pounds of paper records. So one ton of paper was shredded when the SEC investigation was announced. And so now it's a crime to shred documents that might be part of a potential investigation. The other thing we've done as a result of Sarbanes-Oxley is impose more penalties on CEOs when there's fraudulent financial reporting. So a CEO can get up to 20 years in prison and $5 million in penalties for intentionally certifying false earnings and even doing it mistakenly can still get you 10 years in prison and $1 million of penalties. So we ratcheted up the requirements on CEOs if they report false financial earnings. <clears throat> Sarbanes-Oxley was not cheap, though. The Economist it quoted a study that estimated it cost companies about $1.4 trillion to come into compliance with Sarbanes-Oxley. So all of these added legislative requirements, these regulatory requirements we put on companies to make sure they're not defrauding shareholders come, come at a price. There are some other trends that you see in executive compensation. For example, the idea that some companies have pushed for, some shareholders have pushed for the idea that shareholders should approve the compensation of, of, of CEOs. That's generally not the case right now. It's just the board that approves the CEO pay. But the idea that shareholders should have to approve it is, a, is an idea that's being pushed. Another one is uh, creating uh, clawback provisions in contracts. So if a CEO performs especially badly or misrepresents anything, you can claw back any of the compensation they've already received, meaning force them to pay it back. And there's also an effort to prohibit golden parachutes or at least limit them. So that way CEOs who perform badly can't just bail out and get millions of dollars as a result of bad work. All this is to say, and to wrap it up, these are complex issues in the ways that, that companies are governed. We want to create an environment in which CEOs and boards of directors can engage in risk-taking behavior. That's how companies grow. But we don't want to create a set of incentives where they face no consequences at all for bad decisions. And that's kind of how it works still today, is, is that boards and CEOs tend to be shielded from the worst outcomes. And so we're, we need to kind of shift a little more back towards shareholders so that CEOs and boards of directors have more accountability. Um, but how that's done in detail is hard, and that's what we're figuring out. And uh, that's it. So thanks, everybody. I'm glad that uh, you could uh, get the material this way, even though we'll be short on time to talk about it in class. And I look forward to seeing you all uh, when we're back from the break. <laughs>